And so, our speaker this morning is one of our staff ministers here at the temple. He's also a teacher, a prolific writer, and he's here to share with us another of his carefully crafted messages, which is sure to give us much food for thought. My friends, please help me welcome Reverend Michael Record to deliver this morning's message. Reverend Michael. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for opening this service this morning, this beautiful morning, so in such an able manner with your usual expertise and joie de vivre. Thank you all. Good morning, friends. Again, a hearty welcome to you worshiping in the sanctuary of the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, on this absolutely beautiful morning. And a welcome to you too, listening online. It is good that you are also here. Last week, we joyfully and gratefully celebrated our 40th anniversary. So this week, we start our second 40 years. We all know that in general, birthdays are good times to take stock of our lives, to ask who we are, where we're going, and the like. And I'd say that it's mandatory for this church to take stock as we begin our second 40 years. The unexamined life is not worth living, Socrates points out. And our self-examination calls for reflecting on our essential purpose in life. I don't mean the purpose of this individual center, the Temple of Light, but the essential purpose of our mother church, the religious science institution birth about a hundred years ago in the United States. It is currently headquartered in the city of Golden, Colorado, so named because it was, it was once a gold rush town in those far off days. Fundamentally, according to our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, we are a teaching institution. What do we teach? On the back of the Temple of Light service, Sunday service program, those who are in church can now read that the religious, that religious science is a philosophy a science, and a religion. And those disciplines are all reflected in our teaching. In one word, though, we teach truth. That's truth with a capital T, because it's a special kind of truth, the kind that liberates. It's the truth that I refer to in this talk, which I have titled, The Truth Shall Make You Free. You may remember that those are Jesus' words, spoken on an occasion I'll talk about in a little while. But first, what does the sentence mean? The key words are truth, and free. The truth which will make you free is your correct understanding of life and treating the world as it truly is. You can't believe the world to be one way when it's really another. For example, 
You can't look at dry land and think it's the sea, or vice versa. And you certainly can't act as if the land were the sea. For one thing, you couldn't plant yam. Secondly, you could drown if you mixed up land and sea. People who are hallucinating, seeing pink elephants in the room, for example, are not experiencing the world as it truly is. Now for the word free. Being free, I define as having the ability to do what you want in life, to fulfill your potential, self-actualize, as Maslow used to put it. That means having health and energy and sufficient stuff, physical material, to create or buy what you want. A sculptor, for example, would need clay or marble. A pianist or a composer would need a piano. Being free means being unconstrained mentally, physically, and materially in the context of your desires and ambitions. Now the word truth is also found in this following excerpt from an Ernest Holmes essay, Essence of Science of Mind. The passage explains in simple, down-to-earth, non-theological terms what we teach. And I quote, we teach that right thinking will result in a greater experience of success and abundance. A successful person thinks success, and the law of mind has no other choice than to produce an effect corresponding to the causative idea. The road to freedom lies not through mysteries or occult performances, but through the intelligent use of natural forces and laws. The law of mind is a natural law in the spiritual world. We need not ask why this is so. There can be no reason given as to why the truth is true. We do not create laws and principles, but discover and make use of them." Unquote. You may be wondering what the phrase that Dr. Holmes used, the law of mind is. Well, you can learn all about it by attending a short course on mental equivalence that is held online on Thursdays from 7 to 9 p.m. It started last Thursday, so it's very easy for you to join in. And it is facilitated by Reverend Ann Shand and Sonia Davidson. You can phone the center for details. But a major aspect of the law of mind is this. Your consciousness outpictures as your experience. Now there's a lot to unpack in the paragraph by Dr. Holmes, which I just read. And as I do the unpacking in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be looking at several aspects of truth. Again, truth means correctly understanding life. I'll point out that the truth shall make you free means the same thing as Dr. Holmes's opening sentence. Right thinking will result in a greater experience of success and abundance. Truth is equivalent to right thinking and 
The experience of success and abundance is what you have when you are free. So the truth shall make you free. The rest of the paragraph elaborates on Dr. Holmes's opening statements. I'm going to, in this talk, give you a few examples of wrong thinking and counterproductive behavior, the opposite of truth. And I'll end my talk by discussing Jesus's fundamental instructions for the correct approach to life. In other words, his truth. And that is the structure of my talk, a very simple structure. During his sermon one morning, a pastor told his congregation, those who want to go to heaven, raise your hands. Everybody did, except for one little boy. The surprised pastor asked, Son, don't you want to go to heaven? Not right now, was the reply. What happened there? Obviously, there was a misunderstanding by the boy of what the pastor meant. The pastor, as the sender of the communication, you know, sender, receiver, the pastor as the sender of the communication made the mistake. And that mistake could be called confusing communication of his message. He should have been more specific. We see another type of mistake. Wrong thinking, again, mistake, wrong thinking. In this fable by Aesop, a slave and a storyteller who lived in Greece about 2,600 years ago. Here's the fable. A dog carrying a bone over a bridge pauses to look down into the river and sees what he thinks is another dog with another bone. Mistaking the reflection for reality, the dog opens his mouth to bark at the other dog. The law of gravity does its work, and the bone falls into the river. The moral of the story? Appearances can be deceptive. Do not judge the world solely by what you see. What you see may be not what you get. We find that same moral in an allegory called Plato's Cave. The philosopher Plato also lived in ancient Greece, like Aesop, a century or so before Aesop. And he was as great a philosopher as Aesop was a storyteller. Plato's Cave, the allegory, tells of a group of people who have been chained inside a cave all their lives. They watch shadows on a wall from objects passing in front of a fire. They give names to these shadows, which are the prisoner's reality. They have never seen anything else. Plato is saying in this allegory, that many humans, perhaps most of us, are the prisoners and the world is our cave. Things that we think are real are actually just like the shadows on a wall. Now, what would happen if one of the prisoners escaped and left the cave encountered the real world outside and came back into the cave and spoke of the very different sunshine-lit real world out there. And I can't help looking outside at our sunshine-lit lit world in the temple of, at the Temple of Light's premises. What would happen if somebody left the cave 
went outside experiencing the real world with trees, animals, mountains, and rivers. You know the Jamaican saying? A fish come from river bottom and tell you, say shark down there, believe him. There will always be people who don't believe statements by others about their lived experiences. People who need to experience for themselves. We could call them the doubting Thomases of this world. And we bless them, for they are scientists. They demand proof. But what of the others who refuse to accept any new information or scientific data that could cause them to change their worldview. Their stubbornness or inflexibility results in their refusing to move with the times and choosing to live in the past. Some of you might remember the Charles Dickens character, Mrs. Havisham. She lived in the past. They may be proud that they are conservative and like looking back to the good old days, as they call them. But it is not an intelligent way to live. Time keeps moving. You can't stop it. Life keeps changing. You can't stop it. But here's a confession. I was like that when it came to cell phones. I refused to get one. And even after my wife gave me one for my birthday, it was a month before I used it. And now, I can't live without it. Let us hurriedly move on to another sort of mistake. I don't want to dwell on that foolish uh, point of view of mine where I could do without a cell phone. Let's hurry on. There are currently millions of people in America and elsewhere and elsewhere who do not believe the science which says the coronavirus vaccines should be accepted that the vaccines save lives. They ignore the fact that more than 90% of the ill and dying in hospitals in the United States and perhaps elsewhere are people who did not get vaccinated. While only a tiny percentage of vaccinated people get seriously ill. For various reasons, perhaps even some understandable ones, those millions of people don't trust the vaccines. And you might understand if they were what we call ordinary people in the general population. But when intelligent, educated people, professionals in the health services, for example, don't accept the scientific data, one has reason to be troubled. There was a case last week of more than 150 employees in a Houston hospital system who refused to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Amazingly, they preferred to be fired or they resigned after a judge dismissed a lawsuit over the vaccine requirements made by the hospital. I'm not going to judge them. I let a doctor do it instead. In a letter to the editor, Dr. David Hurwitz wrote, and I quote, well, the 150 Houston hospital workers fired for refusing to get a COVID-19 shot are taking a stand for stupidity, unquote. And let us agree that people do sometimes act stupidly. You're looking at one of them. 
Dr. Hurwitz's letter continues, citing facts. Vaccines have risks, but interestingly, not long-term risks. Vaccine re reactions occur within a month and not after that. The risks so far pale in comparison to the carnage that the COVID pandemic has left in its wake. These workers at the hospital are dishonoring their profession by neglecting patient safety and showing their ignorance of basic scientific facts. I have confidence that this group of people will not get their shots after the vaccines win full approval from federal regulators and will join other anti-vaxxers in spreading dangerous COVID virant, virants. Unquote. That, those were the words of Dr. Hurwitz condemning the actions of the Houston hospital workers. Now, I empathize with the good doctor. In my view, putting your life and those of your loved ones at risk is the most stupid thing that you can do. It goes against the basic instinct of, that all animals have, the instinct to survive. So why are these people, or at least some of them, being so stubborn? This news item gives one explanation, and I quote, a recent Washington Post ABC News poll showed 74% of people who haven't been vaccinated say they are probably or definitely, they probably or definitely won't get vaccinated. The divide fell sharply among party lines. The survey showed that 80% of the Democrats have received at least one vaccine compared with 45% of Republicans. Only 6% of Democrats said that they are not likely to get vaccinated, compared with 47% of Republicans, including 38% of Republicans overall, who said they definitely will not get the vaccine. And I, that's on quotes. So there you have another activity. It's just an example that divides society, politics. Now, this political point of view is a specific instance of a common mistake that is made generally, which is the one that I want to focus, focus on. On questioning following of race consciousness. That's the mistake. You just go along with what people are doing without, as Socrates wants you to do, examine why you're doing it. People who put political allegiance over personal and family safety have, in my opinion, a major psychological problem. Though I don't know the name of it, it is a warped way of thinking. It goes against, as I said, the survival instinct. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, America's leading infectious disease expert, agrees with me. One news item said that he lamented the divisiveness that has plagued the United States in its efforts to counter the pandemic and stress that the overwhelming proportion of people who are getting seriously ill or dying from COVID-19 are those who are unvaccinated. We had mentioned this earlier, over 90%. I'm moving now from the news media to the Bible, to some errors in thinking about the world that Jesus encountered. You'll remember that hours before he is crucified, we find Jesus talking about our topic this morning, truth, with Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. In answer to Pilate's question, 
Jesus says, yes, I am the king of the Jews. But then he adds that his kingdom is not of this world. He states, and I quote, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is part of the truth heareth my voice, unquote. Pilate responds with a famous question, one that every philosopher asks. What is truth? Unfortunately, Pilate does not wait for the answer. Just about everybody, Pilate, Herod, many of the Jews of the day, misunderstood Jesus' teaching and mission. They didn't realize that his kingdom was spiritual, not physical. That is why they killed him. But I want to look not at the end of Jesus' life, but at the beginning of his ministry. Specifically, I want to discuss the three mistaken suggestions made by what the Bible refers to as the devil when Jesus was in the wilderness. According to the metaphysical dictionary, the wilderness represents wild thoughts, and I can buy that. In Luke 4, we read that after his baptism at age 30, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness for a 40-day retreat. The Gospel tells us that Jesus frequently took himself away from the world to commune with the God within. The 40-day period is the longest retreat that we read of in the Bible, and it makes sense because as Jesus prepares to begin his ministry, which he had been preparing for all these years, from the time that we first hear about him as an individual when he was 12 years old in the temple, talking to the, the authorities there about God's business, from that time until he was 30, he was preparing for his ministry. So he needs some time alone, to come up with a strategic plan. Now, we at the temple are currently working on one, as you know. And there's an extraordinary general meeting, let me remind you, to discuss that plan next Sunday. Back to Jesus. So Jesus is fasting for the 40 days. And after that period of time, he's famished. Not surprisingly then, the first of the temptations by the quotes unquote devil is food related. The devil, let me say, represents the bad ideas that come to Jesus, ideas for wrong courses of action. The first temptation is that Jesus could serve people by supplying their material needs symbolized by the bread that Jesus is tempted to make out of the stones around him. We know that giving people stuff, material stuff, is a popular way of serving and controlling. Ask any politician. Jesus rejects that idea, declaring this truth, I quote, I quote, man shall not live by bread alone, unquote. Man shall not live by material things alone. And Jesus makes the same point elsewhere, reminding us that material things should not be stored up as they tend to rot. I'm sure you all remember the passage. In the next temptation, the devil shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and says Jesus can have power and glory in them if he will worship the devil. Again, we know that many people in positions of authority want material, I'm sorry, 
want national and international power and admiration. And through these power and fame, they would have people following them. The names of certain dictators and a former president whom I will not name come to mind. Jesus rejects that approach with a reminder to himself. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus is saying that he's against self-glorification and the worship of any human being. Only God is to be worshiped. For the third temptation, the third bad idea, let me remind you, the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and tells him to throw himself off it. Since you are the son of God, says the devil, God will send his angels to protect you from injury. Here, Jesus is being invited to serve humanity by performing magic and miracles using God's power, the only power there is. We know of those sorts of people from, among other places, a story in Exodus chapter 7. It is set in a time when the Israelites are still held captive in Egypt by the Pharaoh, the ruler of the Egyptians. In this story, God tells Moses and his brother Aaron that when Pharaoh tells them to perform some miraculous act, Aaron is to throw down his staff to the ground. And God promises that it will become a serpent. So said, so done. But when the Pharaoh calls the court sorcerers and magicians, and they too throw down their staffs, their staffs also turn into serpents. But the story ends, you'll remember, with Aaron's snake swallowing the magician's snake which leaves the Pharaoh exceedingly upset. So Jesus is rejecting the idea of being a performer, being a magician, and having people follow him with his declaration to the devil. I quote, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Unquote. Being a performer would not have suited a man like Jesus. With our hindsight, we know that he approached the serious business that he had to do in a really serious way, not as a magician. After this third temptation, the devil leaves Jesus for a while, according to the story. Now, Having looked at some bad ideas, some wrong approaches to truth, we turn to Jesus' prescription for finding and living truth and so becoming free. We get that prescription in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. There Jesus is asked by a Pharisee who is, I quote, an expert in the law, Unquote. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, I quote, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets." Unquote. Unpacking this prescription, we hear Jesus saying we should love God with all our emotions, that's our heart, all our spiritual essence, that's our soul, and all our intellect, that's the mind part of us. And he adds that that first and greatest commandment 
is just like the other one. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. He seems here to be equating love of neighbor and self to love of God. Could this be so? Yes, indeed. For in Matthew 25, he says that what good you do to the least of men, like feeding, clothing, or sheltering them, you probably remember the passage, whatever you do to the least of them, you do to God. In other words, you love God by loving your fellow man. Please note that this thinking is in line with science of mind teaching that we are all connected, and in fact, we are all one, all united in the body and mind of God. And that is the truth that shall make you free. Namaste.